Beautiful. See the lovely bone structure? Magnificent them. jaws. And of course, the, the alligator, the tooth fits into a wee socket, so you don't see the big tooth at the side. And that's often a way of differentiating between crocodiles and alligators. This is a very oh unusual croc, isn't it? What is, what's that? Well, just look at the shape of the... The, the nose. It's like a spoonbill, isn't it? Aye. That's a crocodile called a gavial, which is a fish-eating croc, and this specially developed jaw is so it can swish through the water and with ease, so there's no resistance to the water. And, of course, these big jaws can catch their slippery prey oh and hold it, because yeah. fish might tend to slip out. It's like a portcullis, isn't it? Lovely, eh? <laughs> That's the gavial. Now, this is the daddy of them all. This is the Nile crocodile. It's quite heavy God, well. yes. And you know you can tell the length of the crocodile by the length of the skull. But just look at that jaw bite. No, now goodness. that can take mammals, so it has to be powerful. And if you watch the big tooth when I close it, it fits into a notch. So if you can see a tooth sticking up at the side, that is a crocodile. Well, you say that it eats mammals, but with jaws that big, I mean, what sort of mammals? Well, when they start off as babies, you know, they'll maybe take insects and things like that. As they mature and get on a bit, they'll go for snails and small fish. When they come to this size, of course, to full adults, they'll take birds and very large mammals, which is why they need such a massive skull, really. You see, the Nile crocodile, which is the biggest one in Africa, can attain sizes of up to 16 feet, and they'll attack their prey on land or in water. And although people think they're slow, they'll approach their prey stealthily and then have a sudden burst of speed and grab it. They could also, by the way, sweep an animal off the bank with that strong muscular tail, so they don't have to hang on. Once they've got the animal in the water, their technique is to drown it. But remember, crocodiles also breathe air, so they've got certain lovely, nice developments. They've got wee lids and flaps that cover their eyes and their ears, but they've got a special flap at the back of the mouth, which comes from the base of the tongue. And this closes off the mouth so that the animal can open its jaws under water and still breathe through its nostrils above water. So when it's got a good grip of its prey, it hangs on, spins its body around and tears off a nice swallowable chunk. Oh, gosh, yes. Nature's red and raw in tooth and claw, isn't it? Ugh. Yes. Anyway, I suppose it's all gripping stuff for herpetologists. Anyway, John had to keep his cool when he helped tackle another rather powerful-looking reptile. Well, here I am with this great monitor lizard. I don't know about this being Roger's favourite. I'm not so sure it's mine. Roger, come on in and get a hand with this <laughs> monster. <laughs> Looks a bit like the dragons, you know. Yeah, it certainly is. Fairy tales. It's very strong indeed, isn't it? And this is your favourite, is it? I think so. They are spectacular animals, aren't they? Ah, well, you know, I, being a vet, I'm always interested in illness. Yes. Now, a lot of the reptiles that you deal with are very quiet and still anyway. They look a bit lifeless to me even when they're fit and healthy. So how, how do you tell when a reptile's ill? Well, it's really, again, getting to know the actual behavioural patterns of that particular species. Um, and that varies from species to species. For example, small lizards are often on the move uh -huh. quite a lot. This animal's intermediate between, say, the small lizard and, say, a large python. He's moved a bit, a bit for yes, me. Yes, he certainly has, yeah. yeah. And things like this, um, they, that's quite normal for a reptile. He's yeah. shedding his skin, you see. But, I mean, if you saw a mammal starting to lose its fur and things like that, you'd be worried about it. Aye, you? because I, I did speak to a guy once and he thought that a snake had bad eyes because they were all milky. But that was part of the skin shedding process. That's the it? slowing process in snakes. That doesn't happen in lizards. Um, they don't milk up the eyes or anything like that. It just continually comes off, as you can see here. So if you see a snake with spectacles on, it's part of the natural process. That's right, yes. yes. But in my job, you know, as a small animal vet, if I have a cat or a dog or even a budgie that goes off its food, that's a sign of illness. Mm. Would that apply to reptiles? No, of course not. It would um, be quite normal for a reptile, um, say a, a large snake, to go off its food for a year or so. I mean, the record's, in fact, about two and two and a half years. Um, this big lizard here is fed about once a week, and so that's quite normal for it. In fact, you can see he's got plenty of weight on him, so once a week maybe a wee bit too much. So you must take care not to make these assumptions. Yes, um, they're quite different behaviour. They don't move about as much as mammals, so therefore they don't eat as much food. OK then, Roger, you hang on to your favourite reptile, and I'll... Because I've got another wee problem here. Naturally, it's in a bag, mm -hmm. being another reptile. Now, let me just duck in and grab it out for you. That's it. Just let's have you out like this. Wait a wee minute. That's it. Now, you see here, just on the side of its head there, yeah. you can see that growth-like thing on its skin. Yeah. Now, what do you think that is? Well, this is quite common for this species. This is European green lizard, John, and uh -huh. um, they come from rather dry conditions in South Europe. And when they're kept in captivity and in damp conditions, this is a growth that looks like a fungal growth uh -huh. on the skin, and it's done through, or it's caused by... Uh, damp conditions. 
So will you scrape a bit of that skin off and have a look at it under a microscope? Yes, and do a test and find out um, what, the, what we could use to cure it. Which Stand particular it. fungus? Yes. But like so many diseases, there's something goes wrong with this environment first, and then the germs move in, that, or the particular infective agent moves in. That's right. This is basically caused by the captive environment, uh -huh. um, rather than it's not a natural thing in the wild as such. So really, that leads us on to the, probably the basic fact that it's natural history that you've really got to know about when you're starting yes. up on these things. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me as if some slimmers could take some advice from the snakes, John not eating for a week, but I don't know about a year. I think that's a bit too drastic, don't you? Yeah, but, you know, Roger was telling me that the monitor lizard, one of the big problems is obesity in a captive environment. And, you know, me, I have three meals a day. I don't know how many you have, but I'm a bit troubled with obesity. So you have to be careful. I think it's very important to know what you're doing with strange animals. And the most important thing is to learn your natural history. That's to find out how animals behave and how they live in nature. Reptiles, for instance, are poikilothermic. Now, I don't know if you know what that means, but it means cold-blooded. Although that's not strictly true, because many reptiles have temperatures around our temperature. And a better term might be ectothermic. That means that they're dependent upon the environment for their body temperature. And that's why you'll see lizards abroad basking in the sun, because they use the sun for their energy. Now, mammals, birds, that's people like us, are endothermic. We generate our own temperature inside, and we keep it stable around about 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. The dog is about 101.5, and the hen, higher still, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. We're a bit wasteful, though, for endotherms, because 80% of all the calories that they eat are converted for, for heat. And reptiles, if you take one that's about the same size as an, another mammal, it'll only eat 10% of the food. Endotherms, though, can live out at night in the cold. That's why they're so wasteful with food. They can be active at night, and they've got some delicate organs where the temperature mustn't fluctuate. So that's why you see poikilotherms, or, now we know more correctly, ectotherms, in hot climates. Not surprising that we haven't got any of them here with the temperatures we get, you know. But we do have a few lizards, and we have some amphibians that are cold-blooded, or ectotherms. And this, I'm afraid, is not one of them. This is a rather tropical-looking frog, Marlon. Isn't it beautiful? Yes, now, he's uh, quite a favourite of ours now, ah, isn't he? Ah, it's the old white tree yes, frog, although he's brilliant green. Yes. Do you feel lovely. the suckers when he goes onto your hand? Oh, yes, you can. I can you feel you. how cold he is oh, as well? He's very cold, yes. Mm. Yes, not just cool, very cold indeed. You have to watch, though, because amphibians like this can lose fluid through their skin, whereas crocodiles and reptiles don't. They tend to, to keep it in sight. Beautiful. So, will I pop it back in for you? Go on, he's beautiful. You don't want to hang on to it? I'll hang on to it for okay. a Okay. Now, here is a true reptile. This is the chameleon, and look at the way he's gripping onto my fingers, because he's got beautifully designed feet, and he has a prehensile tail so he can wrap it around sticks and bits of branches. If you look at the wee claw, grab my wee, f my wee finger, son. He's very active, That's isn't it, he? like that. He's got three toes at the front, two at the back, so he can get a good grip. And then he, he's got these wee turreted eyes, and he can look both ways. So he, they virtually go around on 360 degrees, don't they? Yeah, and they can act independently. Yeah. This one comes from Harewood Bird Garden, would you believe? <laughs> And I saw him there with a locust climbing up his back, and he fixes it with his beady, turreted eye. And he's not hungry, of course, they get well fed at Harewood. And I saw it creeping right up, this locust, sitting on top of his head, would you believe? Taking a risk, mind you, because he could have knocked it off with his toe and then shoot out this long, split, sticky tongue. Half the length of his body, grab it, and it's done in seconds. Well, the locust must have known he wasn't hungry. Yeah, he really? hasn't changed colour yet, Marlon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pop him back in. I think we'd better pop the in frog back as well. He's and back in there. with this big amphibian. In you go. Now, here we've got another one of the reptile class. This is a box turtle. Now, use, I mean, it's kids have got turtle. terrapins and things. Yeah. Yes. It's called the box turtle, Marlon, because under here he's got a hinge. And when he pulls his head in, he can just shut the box and he's immune from all trouble. Very useful, that. You have a wee high of him like that. Maybe. Because, Marlon, the things that we're familiar with are kids' pets like terrapins and, of course, tortoises. And I have a pretty strong thing to say about tortoises. I don't think anybody should keep them as pets, really. Well, yet yeah, they've always been regarded as, a, as an ideal children's pet, haven't mm. they? But what do they do with them, Marlon? They keep them here, and there was a quarter of a million brought into Britain alone last year. And not many of these survive one year of life in this country, and they're supposed to be long-lived. The other thing is, and this is a bony carapace of, you know, obviously a dead tortoise. The tortoise here lies on top, and if I take this off, you'll see how beautifully matched it is to the underlying bone. And you see the hole at the back? That's man-made, of course. Mm, to tether the poor thing. To tether yes. it. But it's pretty cruel, because that's drilled through living bone. Is it? What worries me more, though, is that these tortoises, I mean, in France, they even eat them, you know. Mm. But here, as pets, 
bad enough, but the tortoise is becoming endangered because they're using you know, them as pets and eating them and so forth. But in Victorian times, tortoise shell was used for glasses like this, Victorian mm. glasses. Most people will be familiar with the tortoise shell adornments. A surgeon's bloodletting knife of old, very effective for cutting vessels, but look at the handle, tortoise, tortoise shell. shell. Mm. And this rather beautiful Victorian purse inlaid with silver and mother of pearl. Mm, looks very beautiful. Beautiful. But you know, that's tortoise shell. And by the way, tortoise shell doesn't come from the tortoise. It comes mm. from the hawksbill turtle. Oh. And that animal, I'm sure this would have looked far better on that than on any object we Absolutely. could make. Oh, yes, certainly. Aye, so let's knock off the tortoise. By the way, they're bringing in legislation at the beginning of next year, January, to stop tortoises being kept as pets unless under certification. Oh, so there'll be no more tortoises then for, for children? Well, almost, uh, not for children, yeah. but plenty more tortoises yeah. in the wild, yes. which is a good thing. Good, good. Now, here's another little creature here. This is not venomous, it's a constrictor snake. It's quite pretty, isn't it? Pretty, but not very well, Marlon. No, Roger, with it. yeah, Roger came to me and he said, you know, this is being sick, this snake, could we maybe x-ray it? So I thought, well, I've never done one before, but let's, let's try it. So Has come a this occupation. <laughs> come and see. Oh, listen, Marlon, before I get on to the x-ray, this is the skeleton of a rather large python. It's beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. It's now, almost like a work of art, isn't it? I imagine putting it together, all these bones. Yes. But the thing that amazed me was, look at the ribcage. See how many ribs it's got. It's like it's, a fossil, isn't it? Aye. And they can have from 200 yeah. to 400 vertebrae. Well, we talked about this disease yes. last, last week. I wasn't trying to... <laughs> this disease in Wouldn't this... Wouldn't like to be a snake with a bad back. No. Anyway, back to Roger's snake. What I did was, first of all, I took a straight x-ray. Now, here you can see the x-ray of the snake and all these ribs that we've seen in this post-mortem case and all the ribs running back and this lovely spine showing up because you know now that bone shows up on, a, on an x-ray and can't see a lot of the problem. We're looking for something wrong with the bow. So what we had to do... Quite a tricky job, never done it before. Can you hold that, Marlon? We had to give it a barium meal. Now, you'll be familiar with this in humans. They make them swallow the barium, and then they take a quick shot of it, and the barium lines the bowl. So that's what we did. Roger passed a little tube down into the stomach, and I injected barium. And this is the resulting picture. There's the head of the snake for identification. Come down, you can just see the trace of the barium here in the bowl. And there, that dense white stuff, that's the barium lying in the first part of the stomach and bowl. Nothing abnormal there. These little parts really are just where the barium's breaking up. So we left the snake for about 15 minutes. During this, of course, the barium's going further and further down. And then we took another X-ray. And if I can just show you again, because the snake's head is now heading off the plate. Very difficult to keep a snake on an X-ray plate when it's alive. Like this, down the barium here. Can you see when we come to here? You can just see where they have a constriction and then the barium starts to form again. Oh, wow. I reckon there's something wrong there, Marlon, either a bowel tumour or some form of stopping the barium from lining the bowel. So all I can say, Marlon, is we don't know properly yet what's wrong, but we're going to do more x-rays because now we know where to look, and I think we will in the end find out. Well, let's go and look at a real live snake now, shall we? Right. Oh, he's a big one, isn't, isn't he? Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. What type of snake is he, Roger? It's an Indian python. And just how dangerous is he? Well, he's a large predatory animal, and obviously he's dangerous to animals that he sees within his size range as potential prey. Well, he sounds fairly aggressive. He's hissing quite ominously there. Yes, he's not very keen on being in front of the cameras. But he, he's, he's a constrictor, isn't he? Yes, indeed. So under what circumstances would he decide to crush me to death, for instance? <laughs> well, there has been a case recently of uh, an American herpetologist who was killed by a python, and this was resulted at the time he was feeding it. Hmm. And I think what's happened is that the snake's got the smell of the prey food that he was offering it, and he's made perhaps a quick movement, and the python's got a hold of him instead and constricted him and killed him. If he does get aggressive, though, I mean, could you control him, do you think? Yeah, well, I think perhaps with some help. I, w I would need maybe somebody else to help me. Yeah. Now, we, you've said before that these sort of uh, animals have to be kept under very, very sensitive conditions, haven't they? Just how difficult are they to keep? Well, this is a tropical animal. It comes from the Southeast Asia region. And um, therefore, things like humidity and temperature are something that have got to be looked at carefully. So it's difficult to do that in the home environment? I think so, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit glad this is a constrictor snake. The venomous ones, though, are they more developed or less developed than the pythons? Well, they're they? much more developed um, from an evolutionary standpoint than a python. This is a very primitive snake, about 130 million 
years old in terms of fossils. Uh, the recent poisonous snakes are only about 40 million years old. Only 40 million? Well, it's not a long time in geological oh, terms. That makes me quite young, that. <laughs> Listen, I like this hollow fang, big poison sack bit. Can I hold his head? Just yes, gently? you can. Careful. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely beautiful, like that. You know, you've got to admire beautiful snakes like this. They've got, if you look closely, there's the little eyes there. Now, they haven't got lids like we've got that open and shut. They've got a kind of spectacle <coughs> that covers it. Their ears, they've got no eardrums, so they're virtually deaf, but the wee bone, which in us connects to the drum, goes to the jawbone of a snake, so it can appreciate vibrations. So if somebody's approaching, it can know. If you look just at the front, it's got two wee nostrils, and snakes have got very good sense of smell. They do a bit of tracking by that. But there's an important organ that they've got that we haven't got. It's got heat sensors. And if you look carefully, Roger, just along the front of its... Slick. Can you only take it? It's getting a wee bit frisky. Yeah. You can certainly like feel the muscles in Got it, can't you? Yeah. Just, just along the front of its lip here, you can get these heat sensors. It's got a row of them, this python. And what it does is, when it approaches its prey by scent, it can then pick up the heat. And vipers, pit vipers and things like rattlesnakes, who are venomous snakes, have these very well-developed infrared appreciation centres. And they can detect the heat of a human hand from one foot away. And what they do is beam in on it and then strike. And they can tell a temperature difference of as little as three hundredths of a degree centigrade. And the thing that frightens a lot of people is this blackish forked tongue that comes sliding out and then everybody says, Ugh, don't like snakes because of that. The tongue is obviously harmless. All it's doing when it slides out and in is tasting the air, aren't you, son? Tasting the air and it takes it in, wipes it on this Jacobson gland and then it can appreciate its environment. Now, Roger, do you think we can open this mouth and show them? Well, not without a great deal of difficulty, John. It is a big, powerful snake. You're not frightened, are you? Not frightened of it, but it's difficult to do it. You're not, I'm frightened. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I think we can leave it at that. Yes, we'll leave Roger to, uh, to keep him under control. Yeah. Rather you Stuart, than me. I'll tell you what, Marlon, can we yeah. get Stuart in to give yeah. Roger a hand? Stuart, just hang on to the just bomb. Hang to him. Yeah, we'll go and look at something else. Right. <laughs> ah. Now, this is more my cup of tea, Marlon. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? Baby chow. Yeah, a wee Chinese chow. Yes. Now, you know how Roger wouldn't open that snake's mouth? Pretty bad for a herpetologist, <laughs> didn't you think? No, I don't blame him at all. Well, I'm a vet, right? Now, watch this. I'm not frightened. I'm going to open this dog's mouth. Watch it doesn't get you. Now, it's very dangerous being a vet. I noticed the way look, you're doing it with a puppy. Look, look. Oh, 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 oh. Do you see his nice black tongue? Yes, and he didn't like it either, so he's just like the snake, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, chows have got black mouths and black tongues. Very brave wee dog, you know? He is. But now, Sorry, man, I was just going to show you, because Chow's get very bad eyes. This is his good eye, and it's not all that good, it's a bit small. Yes. But if you look at this eye, can you see how it's all gone oh, white? Oh, dear. You see? Oh, is he, is he actually blind, then, in that eye? Yep, totally blind in that left eye. Oh, dear. But let's face it, we've cured the boxer puppy, so that's one down and one to go. I may be able to do something for oh, it. Oh, well, let's hope so, anyway. And talking about puppies, what about the names for our little Yorkies? Any more going forward to the final? Oh, yeah, we've made another selection. Now, you know Roger Meek, this, he's a herpetologist. That's a scientist, and I think his sort of choice, because it's his choice this week to go into the winner's last sort of rota, his choice is scientific. He's picked micro and chip, would you believe? I think micro must be for the boy, because it's sure to be shortened to Mike. Right, and that comes from John Stockton of Chesterfield, so he goes into the, the hat for the last draw. There's another letter I've heard, though, which I think is relevant, from a lady in Sheffield. She's called Diane. I don't think it's the original Lady Diane, but she's from Sheffield. And she's asked about an undernourished python called Kathleen. <laughs> Must be nice. a nice python. <laughs> Kathleen. Well, anyway, Kathleen's not feeling very well. She gets four live gerbils to eat each week. Oh. She has a swim in the bath. She sheds her skin every few weeks. And she's not very good tempered. So, listen, what I'd like to tell you, Diane, about Kathleen, is remember Roger's warning. Pythons are very dangerous animals, and when you say yours is bad-tempered, it's probably a reticulated python, because they tend to be a wee bit funny. The other thing is, don't get into the bath with it, or it may put on weight, and you may be the cause of it. Second thing, remember, underfeeding is always better than overfeeding, and if it's getting four gerbils, and by the way, Diane, no live gerbils, that's illegal. Don't worry about it not eating, because if it's an adult, and it has, you know, a meal, it may not need to eat for three months, so... The message is, don't worry. One little wee thing, the skin shedding isn't important. If it's growing, and yours probably is, it could shed every two or three weeks. When it's an adult, only three times. So the message is, don't worry too much, and no live gerbils. Right, absolutely, poor gerbils. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, we're nearly at the end of the programme, John, so what's your message this week? 
Well, whether your favourite choice is a wee chow like this one or one of Roger's more exotic reptiles, do remember that they all have senses and feelings, which although they may be very different from ours, are every bit as important. Looking after any animal is a very responsible job, so do unto them as you would have someone do unto you, and you won't go far wrong. Well, next week we'll be taking a closer look at the lifestyle of our feline friends and seeing some of the problems and diseases that can threaten their legendary nine lives. Until then, good night. Roger Meek appeared on the programme by courtesy of Leeds University Zoological Department. And a reminder that It's a Vet's Life returns in two weeks' time.